You can get a lot of benefits out of martial arts. Just do them. You don't even have to be a champion. Hey there, everyone, and thanks for checking us out. It's episode 27 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, and we're the only place you can hear the best stories from the best martial artists. I'm your host, Jeremy Lesniak, and I'm also the founder of Whistlekick, makers of the world's best sparring gear, as well as some awesome apparel and accessories, all for traditional martial artists. I'd like to welcome our new listeners and thank those of you coming back to the show. Don't forget our great products, like our ever-popular base layer No Sweat t-shirt. It's great for wearing under your uniform, out to the gym, or whatever you're doing. And now it's available in even more colors. And you can find more information about the No Sweat shirt and the rest of our products over at whistlekick.com. All of our past podcast episodes, show notes for this one, and a lot more can be found over at a different website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And while you're on our website, sign up for our newsletter. But now to today's episode. On episode 27 here, we're joined by Mr. Cecil Washington. He's a lifelong martial artist and founder of the blended style Sisu Ryo. Mr. Washington has extensive martial arts background, primarily in Judo and Taekwondo. Based in Maryland, Mr. Washington has lived a life full of passion for the arts, and that really comes through in our conversation. He shares some awesome stories, and I really enjoyed speaking with him. And with that, Mr. Washington, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Well, thanks for having me. It's great to have you here. So I want to know more about you. So we've exchanged some emails, but unlike a lot of the guests that we've had on the show, I, I don't know anything about you. And so I'm going to guess that a lot of the, uh, a lot of the listeners don't know it much about you. So why don't you tell us how you got started in the martial arts? Well, I technically got started in the martial arts when I, I'm thinking I might've been three or four years old. All I do know is I was too young to be on the mat. But apparently my mother took us to uh, Tucker Road Community Center in Fort Washington, Maryland. And we took judo lessons there from uh, Edwin Takamori. And I'm, I'm saying this because I barely remember it. I kind of remember going there and being told rolling around on the mat a little bit being told you can't you shouldn't be doing this you're too young and i get i remember being mad about it Hmm. and i must have learned something or done some stuff because when i would get into fights later the judo throws would show up and i thought i was making these things up so the reason why my mother put us in judo is because um our cousin He's uh, Grandmaster Lawrence Ford. They used to work together. He told her it would be a good idea to put your kids in martial arts in different grades. And so, you know, to a lot of people, everything is karate. Right. So she put us in judo. And one thing I do remember is I know there was one night I didn't go with the rest of the family. I guess I had school or something. I was took a nap or something. And my mother came home. She was upset. And now I know what happened because some of the people that were there I ended up working with later anyway. It was the night that my sister threw my mother in Ipon Seo Inagi. That's the big one-arm shoulder throw. Yeah. And she landed pretty hard, and that ended my mother's <laughs> judo career. Whoa. <laughs> but what I did pick up there was the first four throws in the judo set. Now, okay. fast forward a little bit. There was a guy in my neighborhood... Uh, he was dating a lady that lived two two houses down. At the area that I that I grew up in, I don't really call it suburban. It was more like sub suburban. It was like really rural. Even though there were a few, it was like a few houses back in the woods back then. And uh, he was dating her, and you know I'd watched you know kung fu theater or whatever on TV, and I heard he do karate, so I used to pester him. And so he showed me basically he called it dragonfly. It was really the three levels of punching. But he showed me three levels of punching and he showed me front kick and side kick. And he tried to show me roundhouse kick, but whenever I did that, I would fall. And what really got me into formal classes was one day, I, I was a freshman in high school and I was being picked on by this sophomore. He was smaller than me, but he knew something. I think it must have been some type of capoeira, right? So he pulled a knife on me the day before when I was on the bus and put it to my ear from behind was like intimidating me and stuff, right? Yeah. And I was scared at first, but then I got angry. But I'm, I knew better than to try to attack somebody that's got a knife. 
So I went home and being typical stupid teenager, I didn't tell my mother. What's wrong? Nothing. So I should have said something. I didn't say anything to my mother. My brother knew something was wrong, but he, he let it ride. And so when I go back to school, I hide out waiting for the guy to go to his locker because somebody told me he always puts his knife in a locker. So I wait for him to put the knife away. And then I confront him and I intimidated him. And I don't, you know, I don't want you picking on anyone anymore. Leave me alone. Right. So instead of letting that go, being an adolescent monkey doing the monkey dance, I know you've heard that term before. Mm -hmm. So I decided to attack the guy when he was clearly leaving because I thought he was going to go and get his brother, which he was. And so I go to attack the guy and I get kicked in the face. Then I try to grab him. I get kicked in the face again. And the next thing I know, this guy is kicking me all up in my face and chest and everything. He's doing a bunch of stuff low to the ground. That I know is like some type of capoeira type of movements. And I was pretty much done. But then he stopped to gloat. And he stopped just enough for me to shake it off. So I just grabbed him, slammed him up against the wall in a lock and just stiff arm. And I kept hitting him and 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 hitting him. And so the principal and vice principal come over there. And the principal, um, I didn't know the principal knew jujitsu at the time. That's how he was able just to get me off with one arm. And the vice principal comes over there. And we, you know, he's reading me the riot act about me abusing my martial arts. And I'm like, what, what are you talking about? What are martial arts? So I, I beat this one guy up, right? That knew martial arts. So I'm thinking, I don't need it. But when I went home, I kept thinking, you know, you only beat that guy because you're bigger than him. What are you going to do if it's somebody that's just your size? You think that's going to work? I kept thinking this over and over and over again. And so I think about a month later, I started, well, I started pestering my mother to put me in martial arts classes. And so she finally puts me in a martial arts class. And it, I just want to jump in for a second. Now, did she know what happened at school? Yeah, she, did that get back to her? Yeah, she knew what happened. Of course she knew what okay. happened. Okay. She absolutely knew what happened. And she got on my case because I should have told her what happened, what had happened the day before. And I should have, because I, I had solved the problem without fighting them, but, you know, pride kicked in. And so I kept telling her, you know, I want to take lessons. I want to take lessons. She's like, why do you want to take martial arts lessons when you beat somebody that knew the martial arts? I said, no, I want to do it. I think I only won because he was so small. And what if it's somebody bigger than me or whatever? So she finally fine, right? So she signed me up for a class. She didn't want to sign me up for the class because they used to have open. It's, you ever, you've heard of open gym where they let people come in. They had an open gym at their community center. And she said, I don't know if I really want you doing this because some of these kids that go to open gym are kind of rough and I think they're going to give you a hard time if they see you going to the karate class. And of course, I thought I knew better than my mother and I said, no, mom, that won't happen, right? And of course, that's exactly what happened. So I get there, I get to class and mind you, I'd only learned one kick that night that I could really do. We went over front, front kick, step side kick, which I couldn't do. And roundhouse kick, which when I would do, I would wobble or fall. So here comes the next day. And I get into it with this other guy. And this guy, I found out, worked out at the, uh, we weren't in Landover, Maryland, but he moved down to the country where I was. And he knew how to box. He used to work out at the Sugar Ray Gym. Hmm. So... He tries to get me in this up, and I say, no, I'm not going to get into it. You know, my mother told me not to get in any fights or whatever. So I go to walk off the bus, and he confronts me, and he won't leave me alone, right? So he's standing in front of me, and I remember I said one of the dumbest things you could say. What? What are you going to do? Are you going to hit me? And he cracked me so hard, I swear. Hmm. My, my eyes went up to the sky. You know how in the cartoons they show the little, uh, little stars and, and little birds? Yeah, I saw stars or something. And so I shook it off and I started fighting this guy. And I only knew one kick, but I did it over and 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 over until he's on the ground. And then I kept kicking him. And then I got on top of him to do what we now call, you know, from MMA, ground and pound, right? 
Yeah. Now, if you can tell your listeners, this is why you don't do ground and pound in the street. His brother ran up and kicked me in the mouth. I still have my teeth because apparently from that judo I don't remember taking. I roll. I'm serious, I rolled out of the kick and came up in like guard. Wow! Huh? And I was surprised I did it right, and so I yelled at him, "Yeah!" Right, just to bluff. And then the principal. I told you the principal was a jujitsu master. He came over there, and he's standing in front of me. Right now, I know he's standing, and he's probably thinking he's going to have to just do some type of simple deflection just to try to get me down so he could hold me down. And then he looks at me, and I look at him, and then we had this little nonverbal conversation where I basically said, please help me. Get me out of here. I'm in over my head. And so he takes me into the office, and he goes into this long diatribe again about how you're abusing your martial arts. And I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. I've only took one lesson. And he said, well, maybe you took it, and you were too young to remember taking it. And I still didn't kick in, but that was when I first got started with formal lessons. I went about three years with John Hawkins for his Tiger. He called it Tiger Hawk Karate. It was his own style that he apparently had created from when he studied Okinawan Karate and Taekwondo. Mm -hmm. And then he stopped teaching. And then I went under Tang Sudo under David Dorsey. He was teaching at another community center. And uh, he, he is his technique. I still remember how just flawless his technique was. He was only a showdown, but I swear he looked like he was about a fifth, sixth degree. Just impeccable forms and everything. And it was only years later when I had stopped for a while and I went back and started looking for classes again. I was about 24. I went to a judo class and I got thrown in Tomoe Nage, but I knew how to land. And first... Pam was Pam uh, Hinkle was teaching the class at the time. She's mad at the brown belt for throwing me into Moinage, but the brown belt's arguing with her, saying, "Look, I could tell he knew something. He looked at how he landed. He knew how to land for it." And so she tells me to. She recommends going up to this other class. Up, I think that was Wakefield Community Center. And when I went there, that's when I saw Mr. Takamori, and that's when I remembered him hmm. because he said something and I remembered his voice. So that's basically how I got started in the martial arts is, you know, I've been bullied. Someone has suggested to my mother that we take it. She was reluctant. But then, you know, this guy's getting into fights. So I'm going to just give him something to hopefully this will discourage him. And it didn't discourage me. It just made me want to do the martial arts more. Sure. And, it, you know, I'm, I'm listening to you tell this and I'm, I'm, I'm it's reminding me of some things that I went through in my youth. And, and I'm sure things that a lot of listeners can relate to. But what what I'm struck by is your attitude throughout that, you know, was, seems very um, realistic. You know, it doesn't have that kind of Hollywood polish that I think a lot of martial artists feel compelled to put on top of their stories. You were bullied. You asserted yourself. You were not just looking out for yourself in that moment, but you were trying to, if, if, if I may speculator you were trying to make sure that you weren't going to have to deal with this every day right which i think is quite often the story and what we're encouraged to do as kids in martial arts is you know the reluctance to use it is so strong that i've seen kids wait too long mm -hmm. And I wish more people, and I hope more people hear stories like yours. And I'm, I'm going to guess you didn't have any issues after that day. <laughs> Am I completely off base? Oh, man. No, I have more issues. Oh, okay. Oh, man. Let's see, because it was, the, I had the guy who was doing that clapper or whatever that was he was doing. I was probably kicking and knocking or knocking and kicking. You ever heard of that style? No. It's actually an African-American martial art. It's. You could consider it extinct now because a lot of people, I've heard that a lot of people that were doing it, they're either real secretive about it so they don't tell people, or they've just pretty much folded them into Taekwondo okay. because Taekwondo kind of does a lot of the same stuff. 
And after that, there was another guy. And see, I didn't know that there was a kid who was going around telling people, oh, Cecil said this about you, and Cecil said that about you, right? So some of these people would want to fight me, and I'm like, why are these people fighting me? And fortunately for me, a bunch of other people figured it out that I was being lied on because they said, I've never heard him say anything. So I got in a fight with this other guy, him and uh, his cousin. That guy hit me with brass knuckles. Oh, my gosh, that hurt. <laughs> He was on something. He was on something. I had to do, um, I had to, like, basically, when he knocked me on the ground, I picked his leg out from under him, and I basically had him fall so that he, his head hit the concrete. Ugh. And that stopped him. It was him and his cousin. And then there was another guy who, he was like, you know how you have those 18-year-olds who are, like, still on the 10th grade? Yeah. type guys that was a i think that was the last high school one where he just pretty much just i guess wanted to just try me out and i was under mr dorsey by then so but my technique was a lot cleaner but i was still only like a i might have been a green belt under hawk so i had to start all over in tonsido so i was still maybe green blue belt level if that and um he knew how to box very well and so my face was torn up but I tried to outbox the boxer, and I said, no, I had enough of it. Because, you know, Pete, you know how some people try to shame a Taekwondo person? Well, all you guys can do is kick, right? You guys don't have any hands. And I'm like 15, he's 18. And then I realized, this guy is shorter than me. So I just backed up and kept kicking him in the chest. I kicked him in the chest like three times, and as he started shaking a little bit. And so then from out of nowhere, my mother comes, she pushes... She must have learned something and just didn't tell me. She pushed us both out the way. She hit him in the arm with the stick she had in her hand. I'm like, why are you doing that? And the whole time, too, his, he has his dog outside trying to attack me, too. So I'm like kicking at the dog and fighting him. I was like, you're embarrassing me, Ma. You know, she's like, you were killing him. Yeah. I was like, I know I yeah. wasn't. She said, yes, you were killing him. If you'd kicked him two more times, he would be dead. And his parents came out there, right? And I don't know how she got a hold of it, but I swear, Jeremy, she had his, like, an arrest record for the guy, his rap sheet. That I think she got from the police, and she said, if you say anything, I'm calling the cops, and I'm going to haul your son off to jail. And plus, he's an adult, and he's fighting a minor. I never had any more troubles out of him after that or anyone else after that, not in high school. So that was done. It was only years later that I found out that, yes, my mother was right. I was killing him. Because if you hit someone in that part of the chest where I was kicking them, you know the dip mock rule? Three to knock down, four to, four to knock out, five to kill. You ever heard that? I, I haven't. I mean, I've, I've heard some things about dim mock, but um, educate me. Well, because I'm not a dim mock expert. I'm definitely a okay. dim mock novice. But okay. I do remember it's supposed to be if you hit three pressure points in a correct sequence, it stuns someone. If you hit four pressure points or whatever in a correct sequence, it knocks them down. If it's five or more, you could possibly kill the person. Okay. And it's not some type of mystery. You know, people try to make it out to be some kind of pseudo mystical thing. Just think of it as what do you think would happen to you if I hit you five times in your temple? What do you think would happen to you? I'm probably going down. Yeah, you'd probably die of a, some kind of. Hemorrhage or something, right? It's right. pretty much the same thing. Okay. I mean, where I've witnessed some impressive stuff with the use of pressure points that we we won't get into, but I've I've seen enough to to certainly lend some some credence to what you're saying. Right. I mean, and I mean, I'm kicking a guy in the chest. I mean, it's not like, and I was because you know we set up the bag and we were hitting the bag. I'm hitting him in the same spot each time. I probably could have killed the guy at least if I'm in the hospital. And I found out that. Um, because I didn't see him in school for a couple of days after that. I found out he had been bedridden for like two days from me kicking him so hard in the chest. How did you feel as, as a kid, you know, at 15, hearing that? You know, you think I would feel like I was really, like, I would feel like I was, you know, Mr. Bad A. But I was just scared and just relieved and kind of worried, you know. 
all that because I didn't. On one hand, I didn't want the guy to bother me anymore. And then I was like worried, you know, could, could I have killed this guy? I mean, I don't know. You know, I had a whole mixture and flood of emotions. Mm. Sure. Well, that's. I've got to say, you've got the most colorful answer to that question of any guest that we've had to date. But I want to take a step forward. So there's a lot of stories you just told us. I mean, you, you wove them together very well. And I, I was, you know, really compelled listening to you. So I'm going to guess you have a lot of other stories. Yep. And you sound like a great storyteller already. So why don't you tell us your best martial arts story? Well, let me see. I, I got a million of them. I would say the best one is the one I always like to tell people and nobody believes it. Okay. I was in the military. I had pretty much stopped practicing martial arts. I would, I would still stretch, though. Once I got that habit of stretching at me, and I actually had gotten that habit of stretching at me from my mother. You ever heard of uh, Jack Lane? Yeah. She had these Jack Lane books, and she made it a game. She would show me the picture, and I would try to get in a pose. And so I was just, I was still stretching out my lower body. I didn't really do much for my upper body. And uh, I was a Marine reservist. So I think this was about 89. And we're going in, when you do reserve boot camp back then, because I was a, I was basically, they called them college recruits. So I did the first part of basic training, right, in the summer. Then it's back to a year being a normal person. And then the second part of basic training which was your school, your, they call it your MOS school where you learn your military job. Right. So I was supposed to be pencil pusher, supply clerk, right? And so one day I'm coming from the chow hall and I hear a bunch of ruckus and I see three guys over there arguing. And it was two guys arguing with this other guy. And the other guy was a Korean guy who learned Taekwondo from his father. I didn't know that. And his name was Min. And his two other guys, one guy up in Toha, the other guy, Divine. They were, Divine was a kickboxer guy, and Pentohas was a karate guy. And so you know the ordeal. They're saying, oh, Korean martial arts suck, right? You can't use that on the street. It sucks. Korean martial arts sucks. It's just a bunch of little kitty stuff, right? And Min is getting really, really, really pissed. And I know this, I'm like, he's getting extraordinarily pissed about this. So I said, yeah, I did a little bit of Taekwondo back in the day. He's like, where'd you learn Taekwondo? He said, from my father. I said, uh, guys, I think you might want to leave this, this one alone. Right? They go, oh, shut up, Washington. Shut up, man. You don't know what you're talking about. It's like, okay, fine. So he says, you know what? You know what? I'll give you guys a lesson. Right? And I'm, I was stupid. I'm thinking, you know, oh, we're going to go over some kicks and punches, right? And, he, and I said, can I, can I get in a lesson too? He said, oh, you want a lesson too, big boy? And men came up to like my chin. So he's yelling up at me. <laughs> you want lesson? Fine. I give all three of you a lesson. All three of you a lesson. Come here tomorrow and chow, right? And somehow it got back to the first sergeant. So I didn't know he was standing out there watching us. So I got there at 12 when we were on lunch break. I got there at 12 and men standing there. He's mad. He's putting this bomb on his arms. It's like some type of sticky bomb. He rolled up his sleeves, right? He's like, yeah, I'm going to show them a real lesson. Show you guys a real lesson. He's like, you ready for your lesson? I was like, yeah, okay. And so then I started taking off my boots. And he's like, what are you doing? I said, I thought you, we were going to do Taekwondo, right? He goes, yeah, okay. So I was like, yeah, it's okay. So I started taking off my boots. He goes, Oh, you don't want to hurt me? I was like, what do I want to hurt you for? You've never done anything to me. So I went to take my boots off. He said, no, 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 no. Okay, okay, okay. I'll tell you what. Leave your boots on. I said, I'm not going to kick at you with my boots because I don't want to hurt you. He said, no, no, no. Leave your boots on. I was like, well, my kicks are slow anyway, but especially with these boots on. But come on, man. He's like, then he insists. like, no, leave your boots on. I'm going to show you something. So I was like, okay. So then the other two guys get there, you know, they're still laughing. Ah! Oh, yeah, whatever, right? Yeah, nah, 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 Korean martial arts. <laughs> All right. And he said, okay, attack me. And we look at each other, we look at him, we're like, what? He said, all three of you attack me. 
And you're like, what? It's like, okay. And everybody can say, it's like, no, attack me for real. I'm going to show you what Korean martial arts could do. It's like, all right. So we all went after him. First, he's like not there. And he's like, he like just kind of did like a J line out of us. So we all kind of crashed into each other. And then they went after him. We all were going after him at the same time. And basically, because he had the bomb on his hands, it was sticky. He's doing like stick, sticky hand blocking and throwing people around and throwing everybody down. After about seven seconds, everybody has hit the ground, but I'm the only one that rolls back up. And he looks at me, he's like, I can't believe you're still standing. I said, uh, I can't believe I'm still standing either. <laughs> so he said, okay, attack me. So I kept attacking him. He kept making me attack him. And he told me to really come at him. I still kept coming after him. And he's just basically just parrying, parrying, or just moving just enough out the way for me to not hit him. And so we're doing this. This must have probably only went on for about a minute. And then he just like had this emotional catharsis breakdown and started talking about, you know, how he had to be in a gang. He didn't want to be in the gang. And and then he, because he was like, he was the only Korean in the Chinese neighborhood, so he had to join the triads or something. So he got in the military to get out of the triads. I never even heard of like the triads or the Chinese gang and all that stuff. I'm like, what? He's like, you know, I don't want to do this anymore. This is like for bad stuff. It's like, and I started talking to him. So I'm talking to everybody. I'm like, you know, maybe you could show yourself, maybe you could use this stuff to teach like good people how to protect themselves from bad people, right? And he's going on. And then the first sergeant comes over there and he's yelling at us because apparently there had been some type of riot like a couple of weeks before we got there. So we thought this was going to be the start of another one. And he's asking me, did I want to press charges? Like, I don't want to press charges. Nobody wants to press charges. You know, we had gentlemen's agreement or whatever, right? And so I get to know this guy and I'm thinking I've hit the gold mine here. Here's the guy that learned from his father. And guess what happened? He was going to share pretty much what he considered to be like the secrets or whatever with me. But guess why he didn't? Want to take a guess? Mm, he got transferred. No. Because I did not know the forms. Hmm. Huh. He said, this stuff is connected to your forms. I said, well, my first teacher didn't believe in forms, which he didn't. And I forgot in the second set for the, t the forms on the second teacher. And he said, uh, go back, learn the forms, and you'll get it eventually anyway. Okay. So I don't learn the forms. Now, how this, this is my best story, because this hooks into another story years later. And I didn't even remember that, but I was in a band and we had a rehearsal. And one of the guys in the band got mad and flipped out and he started yelling at everybody. And he was intimidating everyone, right? And so I went over to him and I was like, hey, come over here and attack me, right? And so he comes at me and I'm moving just enough out of the way. First, I started circling him like I learned to do in high school. And then I stopped. And when he's coming after me, I'm just moving just enough out the way so that he can't touch me. It would be where I would block, but I didn't block. I only had to make contact with him a couple of times until he got frustrated and ran off. And everybody's going, oh, my God, that was amazing. Where'd you learn to do it? And I'm like, I don't know where I learned to do that. We get in the car, and that's when I start thinking and thinking and thinking. And uh, my friend Billy, Billy does Tai Chi. He was the leader of the band. He's like, come on, you got to think about where you learned that. And I started thinking, and then I realized I learned, that was what I learned from men. Hmm. So he, I didn't even realize the guy had taught me something significant, and he had. And I think it was it was at that moment I decided, you know what, I really need to go back and get some formal lessons. So that was what really got me back into martial arts as an adult. That's when I started looking for classes. Huh. What I'm struck by listening to you tell that story, I mean, you know, we're we're we've been talking for a little bit now and even before we started recording and that piece your your exchange with this man was was so vivid so clear i i felt like i was there i could see it and even your language and the intensity of your speech uh, came up as you were getting into it and it's clear that that was really a transitional point for you I mean, you spoke to it, but even if you hadn't, I think it would be pretty clear to everyone listening that that moment, that minute 
that you were involved with him getting thrown around and seeing what martial arts you know really could be had quite an impact on you how old were you at that point uh i was like what 19 okay so so young but certainly old enough to have some context and you had some some martial arts background some life experience so you knew that there was more and so here this gentleman shows you more and it sounds like that kind of hooked you hooked you in yeah I mean, would you would you say that was if you had to pick a moment, was that the moment? The moment that really hooked me in to martial arts, yeah. I would say the moment that truly hooked me in and made me so that I knew I wasn't going to go back was when I was in Tang Sudo as an adult. Okay. And and this was in a tournament. I didn't really want to. One of the bad things about actually having real fighting experiences, you don't take tournaments as seriously as you should. I think mm. because you know it's just a game and because it's just a game you don't take advantage of it for the real value that it has but I was forced to with Calvin this guy's Calvin Peace I hope he hears this because I've told him this before Calvin was a brown belt but he'd been a brown belt forever so he basically fought probably like he was a master or something and I had to fight Calvin so that means I really had to get better. And I couldn't just rely on my speed and my strength and my flexibility. I had to think. I had the one match with Calvin because we both were the finalists. There was only one set of blows thrown, mine and his, during the entire three-minute match. And the only reason why I lost is just because of the angle. I came with a hook to the ribs. He came with a straight punch to the face. I slipped his punch, but I didn't get my hook quite in there fast enough where the judges could see it. And from the angle of all the judges, he won. But he had a better strategy. We spent that whole match stalking each other. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, the dance. And he was, I had to check my breath. Every time I would breathe, he was feeling my breathing. I had to stop breathing at one point and reposition. I knew if I came too close, I could feel him getting ready to come in. And after he scored that point, he just ran the clock out. Hmm. In that match, though, to prepare for that match, I had to do so much soul searching and internal work, man. He really made me work. After that match, I didn't even end up ultimately getting my first black belt in Tang Sudo. But after that match, I said, you know, I have really, I got to really do what that guy, man, told me a long time ago. I got really got to keep at this stuff in order to get it. And I got to, you know, do it in the formal environment. Sure. So tell us more about your time in competition. I mean, that was a good segue there. You mentioned that, that it was hard for you to take it seriously, being that you had some real combat experience. Did that change for you? Yeah, after a while. Um... I've only did, I haven't really done a lot of competitions. I only did some local, a few locals here and there. Mm -hmm. I think what really changed competition for me was when I got in judo. Now, because in, when I was doing the, uh, the uh, karate type, taekwondo, tangsudo type of sparring competition, I would usually place second, third easy. Right? It was really no big deal. But when I got to judo, I was not as good at judo as I was at striking. So when I got to judo, I could still pretty first I was afraid of being thrown around because you know those throws look like they hurt, in which they do at times. Yeah. But when I got to judo, there was a guy there named uh, Taz. Taz is not competing anymore. And Taz already had a black belt in jujitsu. And he wanted to learn judo. So every time it, when, I, when I went up for competition, Taz was there. And I trained with Taz at the dojo, too. And a lot of times, whenever we would match up, he'd win two, and then I would win one. And then he'd win two, and then I would win one. So it's like, he was better than me, but he forced me to adapt. And so every time I would get better, it would force him to get better to stay ahead. So I had that experience with Taz. And another guy showed up. His name was Lamont. And Lamont had a similar, he had a similar type background. Now he's like jujitsu, BJJ, and judo. I don't know if he's gotten his BJJ black belt yet, but he's going on to do some MMA. Mm -hmm. And Lamont was another really good competitor. 
Lamont, Jazz, and Jeff. Jeff, I think, is a fourth or fifth degree in judo. And whenever I had to match up with them, I had to think it was just like sparring with Calvin. So every time I would get better, I'd start, cre I'd start creeping up on their heels. Then it would force them to do something else. And then I'd adapt to that and then force them to do something else. So, I mean, that was one time where I, would, I knew I was going to lose a match if I ever went up against Lamont and Taz. And I tied a couple of matches with Jeff. But it made me better. And it got to a point where it was like, if I went to a judo tournament, if I didn't see them there, I felt like I was wasting my time. But just the pressure of trying to... See, it's different than when you're just fighting out in the street or something. You're trying to defend yourself. You don't have to really have any control or a lot of skill. Yeah, you got to be skilled enough to survive. But when you're talking about you've got X, Y, Z parameters and you have to fight at full intensity with those and can you still pull up what you have to do even though it's dangerous, yet you're not trying to kill anybody? To me, that takes a higher level of skill. You're just beating up some punk that's bothering you. I would agree. I would absolutely agree. But you can't tell the street fighter that, though. <laughs> no, you can't. <laughs> well, you can, but it, it may, may make things worse. It's kind of a thing of... Um, <laughs> Uh, one of my cousins used to call it, you You ain't fighting nobody. And I think it's, I could see it's a trap where you could fall into it in both the competition world and also in the quote unquote real world where you could really think you're great because you're beating a bunch of people, but they really aren't all that talented. Mm. Until you go against somebody that really knows what they're doing. It's just like I had one amateur boxing match and I lost the match on paper. But I knocked the, the winner out. The winner had to be taken out on the stretcher. When he threw up his hand to win the match, he kept falling backwards. <laughs> and I came home and I asked Kevin. And that was, that was uh, doing another part. That was uh, doing the same part of boot camp where I met Ben because Ben also told me to take boxing. And I said, I don't get how I did that to somebody that was golden gloves. And he, he said again, he, he ain't fighting nobody. So you got to understand, these titles are from where they are in their little town. It doesn't mean they actually went up against anybody who knew anything. And I said, well, I didn't know boxing. He said, yeah, but you had all this martial arts stuff that you did before. And the boxing coach we had in boot camp, too, he, he, uh, he did uh, basically boxing and the internal Chinese arts of Xing Yi and Bagua and Tai Chi. And he integrated that into his boxing. Which means you could punch the guy and he could absorb the punch and shoot it down into the ring. Mm -hmm. That's that's good stuff. That's impressive stuff. You know, I've been lucky enough to see some of that in my day. I certainly don't don't know it. And uh, you know, it's interesting as, as we're talking how rounded your background is. I mean, obviously we can all always learn a lot more, but you've I, I like to use this analogy that, um, you know, you've, I'm sure you've played Trivial Pursuit. You've got the little pie wedges, uh -huh. people call them. And I like to say that what, every time you train in a different style or with a different person, you're adding another piece. You know, you're trying to round out that circle. Of course, there, it's never full, but you're always adding more. And, and as you're, you're talking, I'm hearing, you know, more and more pieces of that pie dropping in. So we've we've heard a lot about your your physical skills, but I want to know how the martial arts has made you a better person. I mean, we heard about you as a as a kid dealing with some some rough stuff, and um, I'm sure that that changed you. And I'm sure the martial arts has had an impact on all of those changes. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Well, I think the martial arts has helped me to stay calm a lot of times in chaotic situations. And one thing, I, one thing I really should brag about is that because of my martial arts background, when I start, really started getting into IT, we talked about IT and martial arts before the uh, interview. Yeah. I got picked to go install part of the uh, wide area network for, uh, I don't know if you remember when CVS used to be people's drug. No, we're going Yeah, we're going, we're going way back. back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Going back like 90s, maybe early, I say early 90s. 
And um, I got picked to go on the calls to, I ended up doing the all, it was supposed to be a three phase installation, basically uninstalled the old system, download a bunch of stuff from the wide area network and then install the, the new uh, hardware and software and uh, basically acceptance test it for the customer. I was only supposed to do the first part, but I ended up doing all three because there were some of the neighborhoods around the Southeast DC and some parts of Maryland the people were, the technicians were scared to go there. Mm-hmm. And so I can't, I got called in for an interview. It was, uh, it was this temp company. You know, you know how they have those temp companies that we find the techies and we farm them out to you. Right. And I went in for the interview and the woman said, oh, I had, she said she had a hunch about me talking to me. And I sat down in front of her and she kept looking at my hands. Right. She kept staring at my hands. She kept looking at my knuckles. My knuckles were still dark from when I did conditioning. And so she kept asking me, what were your hobbies? What were you into? What were your hobbies? What were you into? And she just asked me, had you ever done any um, karate or martial arts? And I told her I had. And she's like, okay, this guy's not going to be scared to go into these areas. And I said, well, I guess you think that because of the Marine Corps. She said, no, 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 it's not because of the Marine Corps. It's because of your martial arts. And, you know, I had some, I had the, some of the tech calls like at three, four in the morning and I wasn't scared. Oh. You know, martial arts has made me, you know, not afraid to go into bad situations. I mean, I just needed the money. But it wasn't until years later till I drove by, past one of those stores. Where I knew I did an installation, I was like, wow, I really helped these people here, help poor people. Be able to have the same type of medical access as people out in the suburbs. I mean, because where I live at, my CVS is nice, beautiful, you know, lit up. I don't have to worry about anything going out there. So I think the, just, just the martial arts has given me the courage to keep going on. It's also made me able to, uh, you know, take criticism from higher ups. Because you, know you know from training, you have to do that all the time. Absolutely. Yeah, if you can't handle Criticism, you're not going to grow. No, you're not. You know, you're, you're just going to kind of fall away or, or my, more likely, you know, you're just not going to make it. Right. You know, probably not even going to make it to your first belt. So it sounds like your martial arts background has, has had a lot of contributors, people that you've trained with, people that um, you indirectly trained with or, or maybe even didn't train with. And we've heard about a couple of those. And it actually sounds like the impact from those people might have been bigger than some of your formal instructors but i'd like you to think of the person the one individual outside of your instructors that you would say had the biggest impact in your martial arts career you know i thought i'd have an answer for that. <laughs> <laughs> i would say i would say um it has to be if i could if i had to narrow it down to just one I can't say I can't say my cousin Maurice Grandmaster Four because he ended up being my instructor for a while, even though he kind of behind the scenes kept nudging my mother to do it. Mm. But um, one person would be my mother's boyfriend. His name was Nick. Nick was a uh, special forces when he was in the army, and uh, I, I, he didn't quite talk about everything that he did. When he was over, I think he was in the Korean War. So he talked about some of that. He always encouraged me to keep training. And one thing I think I got from Nick is about being responsible and sharing knowledge because he knew how to do all types of stuff. He was basically like, like Rambo. And I'd ask him to show me the stuff and he wouldn't do it. And kept telling me, you're not ready and I'm not going to let you get yourself in trouble by abusing this stuff if I show it to you. And he just kept sending me back to class, telling me to go back to class, telling me to go back to class. And one thing he told me, he's like, you know, you're a very nice guy and a lot of people are going to take that for weakness. So you're going to have to learn a martial art just to be able to defend yourself against these wicked people. And he would, a lot of times, too, he would talk about bluffing and things like that that he learned from when he was a gambler and how that applied to dealing with people and i've told this story online remember you heard the song the gambler yeah. he used to make me listen to that song <laughs> he, he swore everything you needed to know about 
dealing with people was written in that song. And one thing that's definitely true is you got to know when to walk away and know when to run. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and you never count your money when you're sitting at the table. Somebody no. <laughs> might want to take it from you. Yeah. You know, it's funny. You said that and, and I couldn't help it. You, I, I'm actually going to leave it in so listeners can hear it. You know, we had a little bit of a lull right there. You were probably expecting me to respond, and I'm just running through the lyrics. I mean, I don't know a lot of Kenny Rogers songs, but I know this yeah, one. Yeah, everybody knows that. And every everybody knows that song. And uh, yeah, there's there's a lot of wisdom in that song for sure. And uh, this that'll probably be the first song that we link to in the show notes. So that'll be fun. <laughs> yeah, he swore about a gambler, man. Yeah, my mother's song was "Sweet Dreams" by the Eurythmics. <laughs> Is there martial arts wisdom in that song? She told me you need to listen to that song. I think she was probably thinking more about relationships. But you know, there is some wisdom in that when some of the students, some of the students that you get, some of them are looking for something and some of them want to use you. Mm. And if you're not careful, some of them will want to be used by you. Yeah. And some of the students, they come in there trying to challenge you. They want to abuse you. And some of them, they just seem like masochists. They want to be abused. Yeah. You're you're the first person to bring music in, which I'm I'm all for. I'm a I'm a big music fan. I uh, completely unrelated to martial arts, but I DJed for a while, so well, I, music's a big part of my life. But that's something that's, I found too. Like I found quite a few martial artists also musicians. Hmm. Like my friend Billy, I told you about Billy's. Now he's pre pretty much a professional drummer, percussionist. He literally travels around the world studying the drum. Cool. Well, like, he's not the first. Uh, he's not the first person that I've heard that was like a martial arts slash musician. Like the guy that gave me my Taekwondo black belt, Mister Shorts. He's got a pretty good uh, singing voice. He's got a pretty good voice, and he plays the. I think he plays the drums and the bass. He's also pretty funny too. Hmm. I've seen some of his comedy skits he's put on Facebook. They're hilarious. There definitely is a correlation uh, between martial arts instructors and sense of humor. I don't know why there is. And, you know, here here we seem to be building a profile of, of maybe not typical, but common martial arts instructors. Um, you made reference to, and I'll, I'll explain it now, during our pre-interview, we were talking about how we one of the things we have in common is experience with IT, information technology, computer stuff, mm -hmm. uh, which is what I did for the benefit of listeners. That's what I did prior to founding Whistlekick. But, you know, we both know quite a few people that are involved in martial arts and technology, and there's some synergy there. And I think there's also some synergy with humor. Yeah. I think if you're going to teach martial arts, I mean, I've taught kids, you've taught kids. You got to have a sense of humor if you're teaching martial arts to kids. Yeah, kids are funny. <laughs> they are funny. And sometimes having a sense of humor is the only way to get through a, a class, class on a full moon. <laughs> Those are my least favorite. Yeah, I got I run a toddler class once a week, and it's only, not, it's only uh, from 9.30 to 10 o'clock on Saturdays. Yeah. That's my longest class. <laughs> <laughs> I could absolutely really. I'm to looking that. at the clock. Oh, it's only been ten minutes. <laughs> <laughs> it takes a special type to teach kids. I, I'm I'm okay teaching kids. I know some that are much much better. So, yeah. So who who would you want to train with? If you could train with somebody that you haven't, you know, and we'll open it up, including everybody that's passed on to the other realm. Who who would you want to? hang out and train with well this is where i know i'm going to make some people mad <laughs> go ahead make them mad um i really want to train with sterling johnson i was thinking that if i got when i got asked that question i wouldn't be able to say it but i still technically have not trained with grandmaster johnson okay because whenever i've tried to get pressure point information from him, he just sends me the george dillman so i've met i've met him at a few workshops of that dillman does and i've Talk to him a few times back and forth. So some just say someone I know is still kind of mad at, at Grandmaster Johnson for something that happened 
probably before I was born. I have nothing to do with, but I, I really would like to train with him. And um, you ever heard of Art Mason out of Canada? He's got the Peaceful Warriors. I've heard that name. He's got some YouTube videos, and his knowledge of pressure points is just excellent. And he's he's coming from a Taekwondo base. And it's the same, you know, the General Choi, Chang Han, ITF forms. Yeah. And he really knows how to apply those. I, I would love to train with either one of those. And even, a, you know, I really would like to train with two as far as dead. The founders of any styles that I've studied. Um, and, I, and really would like to train with the founder of Aikido. Because any of his meditations I've read, I, I've really liked. Yeah. Oh, another one would be the guy, Dr. I think it's Wang Jang Min. I don't know him. He wrote um, some, he wrote the book Analysis of Shaolin Shina. Okay. He, that would be an, an, another really good one to train with. You know, other than the typical, you know, everybody wants to train with Bruce Lee type stuff. Right. Which, oh yeah, and I also would like to train with who's living. Now that I've said Bruce Lee, um, what is his name? You had him on the show. He's the guy that's faster than Bruce Lee. Uh, Grandmaster Moore, yeah. Victor Moore. I would love to train with 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 uh, Vic Moore. He 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 still trains people. I mean, he's not uh, not as mobile as he as he once was, but um, there's still a lot of people that that train with him and and learn from him. Yeah, he just so. strikes me as very very knowledgeable. Yeah. Yeah, and passionate about the arts and, and spreading what he knows, too. And for anyone that hasn't listened to that episode, um, I want to go back and listen to it. That was a fun one to record and, and one that I reflect back on yeah, personally. That was a good interview. Yeah, thank you. Um, how about movies? You a movie guy at all? Yeah. Well, when I was thinking about the movie question, I wanted to say something different than what everybody says. <laughs> okay. You could just ask my wife about Karate Kid. She just rolls her eyes. <laughs> <laughs> you watch it. You watch it that much, huh? <laughs> She's like, "Oh my God, is that old man your father or something?" Just give it <laughs> a rest. It got so bad after a while. Like if she come downstairs and she hear Pat Morita, she just turn around and go back up the steps. <laughs> <laughs> I think like um I, for fun, I like um anything with Michael Jai White in it. Mm. Anything, even his bad ones. Uh, I, I I hate to say I really like Black Dynamite. Yeah, that was big, probably because I wasn't allowed to watch those movies when I was little because that's when they were out. Yeah, of course my mother wouldn't let me watch them, but he's just so funny, and he's a really great martial artist. Yeah, but I think like in in terms of a really important lesson that I really could relate to. Did you ever watch the Street Fighter animated series, Street Fighter 2, V? Yeah. Yeah. Going back a bit, but absolutely. Yeah. Remember the episode where Ryu and Ken get beat up by Guile? I don't have that much, that detailed yeah. of a memory from for the show, but okay. It's the one where they thought they were hot stuff because they were, you know, kings of the tournament. Yeah. And then they ran into somebody who was you know, better than them, who was a grown man. And they were supposed to be still kids. And so they go out and they get into some street fights and it doesn't go well for them because even though they win the fights because they're kids, they're too stupid to realize that um, people have lost money on it. So like everybody in the crowd tries to murder them basically and they're running. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking, you know, that's probably something I would have done if I had that ability at that age. Yeah, so I can really relate to that. I've always liked the uh, Street Fighter one. That's another movie that when my wife would see me watch, and she'd just turn around and go back upstairs. The Street Fighter movie yeah, the or Street the show? Both, especially the, oh. the one where he's fighting Sagat in the beginning. I don't know that I could. I can go with you on the on the Street Fighter movie. Oh, that first one, the the one with Van Damme's in that one, right? No, not that one. This is an animated movie. Oh, okay. Thank God. Yeah. Well, anything with Van Damme. Too, I always liked even the even the bad ones. That was movie was terrible, but I loved it. Oh, it was that Van Damme split. Come on, you gotta love it. <laughs> I'm I actually consider myself a Van Damme fan. I just that that movie. I've seen it a couple times, and I just I can't I can't do it. <laughs> I can't do it. I mean, I'm I'm 
there's not a lot in that film that I find redeeming. It, there's it's the the dialogue's bad, yeah. the acting's bad, and the martial arts isn't good enough to save it for me. How about actors? You mentioned Michael Jai White. Oh yeah, he's probably he's probably my favorite martial arts actor. Yeah. Uh, who was the guy that played Bruce Lee in Dragon and Bruce Lee story? Uh, Jason Scott Lee. Yes, I, I like him. Yeah. yeah, I really like that story too. About the whole classical mess. That that I I watched that. I wasn't even really doing martial arts too much at the time. I was doing hip hop, mm -hmm. and it just, especially at that time. And they do it in rap now. It's like there's only one type of rap that's allowed to be the thing at a time. And anything else is heresy. Kind of sounds like another activity that we both would like. You know? Yeah. Yeah. There's only one style that's allowed to be cool and everything else is bad. And if you break out on your own path, people despise you. That type of thing. I think there's some, some wisdom in that, I think, for for everything i think you know you because that that next thing always starts from somebody branching out on their own doing their own thing and and being willing to not be in not be hip for whatever that time is yep how about books you mentioned one earlier you you much of a reader yeah you know just for this i wanted to make sure i wasn't going uh the uh <laughs> so I actually got the books. I'm gonna go through them real quick. Everybody's sure. probably told you about a killing art. Yeah, that's by Alex Gillis. Um, Kodakan Judo by Jigoro Kano. Right, that would be an obvious okay. pick. Yeah, a lot of people sleep on this book, man. I used to read this on the subway, and if you just read the text and meditate on the pictures, if you can go into a meditation state. While you're looking at the pictures of reading the text, it plays right out in your mind. It's an excellent resource for the judoka. Okay. Um, anything by uh, Peyton Quinn or Mark Animal Mac Young. Peyton Quinn's book, A Bouncer's, a Bouncer's Guide to Barroom Brawling, is a good one. <laughs> okay. Uh, this one by Lauren Christensen, Fighter's Fat Book 2. That one really... Uh, it's it's really it's really just goes over diverse things about real fighting and how to apply your techniques. Uh, anything by Mark Animal Mac Young. The one I have here is Cheap Shots, Ambushes, and Other Lessons. I would say the language in this one is not very child friendly. It's not. It's page right here. I just turned to it, and he says something right here. <laughs> the wisdom is true, but you you just can't you just can't have Mark Animal Mac Young for kids. Maybe he needs an abridged version. Or, or a child's version. Yes. yes you know, with some cartoons. Uh, one, uh, The Little Black Book of Violence by Lawrence A. Kane and Chris Wilder. Uh, I reviewed this one on my YouTube channel. It's called Taekwondo Grappling Techniques okay. by uh, Tony Kemmler and Steve Snyder. That's a really good book. It really shows their interpretations of using the, the forms, the ITF forms, of using all those movements as throws and chokes. I think he goes up to uh, Chun Moon in here. No, he goes, he's got a Quan Gay thing in here too, which is good. And there's another book, and I'm sorry, I can't remember the author, but it's called Fist, Stick, Knife, Gun. I've heard of that one. Yeah, he talks about uh, growing up on the streets, just basically the dynamic of... Uh, violence being developed among kids. That's a really good book mm. for the mindset of what those kids have to go through. Okay. Great. And and as always, folks, because I'm sure I, I, I didn't even get all those and I'm sitting here with a pen ready. Uh, so um, after we finish recording, I'll, I'll make sure I grab the, the rest of them from you. Mm -hmm. But, you know, don't forget, we'll have those linked over at, at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com so people can check out. I always link just to the the amazon page for everything not because we get a cut actually legally we can't uh, here in vermont mm -hmm. get a cut from any amazon sales anymore but um just for convenience because that's where everyone seems to buy their books mm -hmm. oh and last but not least of course the general stone right yeah everybody should have that yeah I, i'd say even if you 
aren't a Taekwondo practitioner. I think one of the things I find really interesting about that book is that it was written out. It was yeah. as Taekwondo was designed, he wrote the book. Right. And there are plenty of books on martial arts and there are plenty of martial arts, but this is the only one where the conception of the book and the conception of the martial art happened at the same time. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of neat. Yeah, like his book yeah. and for my judo, I got the I got Kano's book. Those are like two of the best hands down. Yeah. To learn if you're learning those arts, man, you got to get a hold of those. So, we're gonna we're gonna go off script here as as we roll down towards the end. But we talked a lot about your your striking, but. You know, we got some glimpses into your your grappling, your judo, and as you talk about judo, it, it sounds like that's really something that you love. Now, most martial artists that I talk to tend to love one or the other, striking, striking or grappling. So, what is it about grappling that you really enjoy? Honestly, what I like about grappling is I can subdue somebody and not really have to hurt them. I've had to restrain uh, people who have lost their minds. Like they're, you know, just they've gone insane. I've had to restrain people that have gone insane and I can hold them down without hurting them. I've had to restrain a, one thing, and I actually bought this from Tai Chi. This is like Tai Chi slash Judo Fusion. I was on the subway and a guy had a seizure and he was hurting himself. And there were two nurses there, but they looked at me and said, can you hold this guy down? So I tried to go in for like a pen. Like, no, 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 you can't do that. No, 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 you can't sit on his chest. So I put my palm against his shoulder blade to hold him down. Mm -hmm. But the loosening up for judo to being able to get close to the ground helped with that. Judo, can you can really use judo to help people. You don't have to just be destructive with it. You don't have to strike the person. You could just hold them if you have to, even if they're trying to strike you. Right. Yeah, that's. I don't have a lot of grappling experience. I mean, I've got some, you know, certainly some self defense through my various paths through the martial arts. I did some jujitsu for a while, but yeah, I, I'd, I'd agree that that grappling side, there's certainly some some joy in it for me when I can manipulate someone into a position where. They can't do anything. They're they're stuck. They're not in pain at that moment, but there's nowhere they can go. They're trapped, and that's really fun. Yeah. Well, you, it's kind of like a chess match. Well, you know from uh, you know from Taekwondo, a lot of times when you get a really good workout. You probably got a few knots on your arms or something. Yeah. You don't necessarily have to have knots on you to get that same heavy breathing in judo, right. but sometimes you will. Sometimes cool. you will. So what's keeping you going? What what motivates Cecil Washington right now? Any goals? Anything you're striving for? Well, right now I need to get my uh, tornado kick back fluid and all my uh, circular jumping kicks back fluid. I went to demonstrate it for a student the other day, and she was impressed with it, but I wasn't. They were raggedy. I said, ah, I got to do it again. It's like, why? Because you weren't doing it up at your head? It's like, exactly. I mean, you know. I want to demonstrate this thing. I got to have them up like they should be. Like I know I can do them. Mm. That's one of my short-term goals. Is the I just got to practice them again because I've been so busy teaching simple techniques that if it wasn't in the form, I haven't really done the kick. There's the catch-22 as an instructor. Mm -hmm. How do you balance advancing your own training while teaching others? And it's it's something that a lot of martial arts instructors don't like to talk about because it it, sound, it makes them sound um, inadequate, I think, to a lot of people. But I don't know a single instructor that doesn't struggle with that, finding that balance in time. Exactly, especially if you've got a job. Mm -hmm. You know, I, th I think some of these guys that like I've had to study with, I don't think they ever had really had the challenge of having to work a nine to five and then come home from that and still go into a, dojoing for two or three hours but some of them have the ones that have tend to be a little more merciful yep 
Yeah, it, it's. I think it's the dream of many martial arts instructors that they can focus full time on their teaching. But of course, that brings with it all sorts of other challenges because making a living from it then goes from goal to necessity. And there was one guy I was with for a brief, really, really tiny brief minute, but he did give me some business insight. He basically said, you know, when you have the business, you have to be careful that that doesn't become your job because you have to spend so much time getting insurance, making sure everything's taken care of, processing all the paperwork and everything, that you can still get caught up in that and not have time to train because you have to keep the building open. Right. And there's a, there's a challenge in holding integrity. Right. That there are some things that you are maybe a little less prone to do with holding people to standards because, you know, let's face it, not everyone likes to be held to a high standard these days. Yeah. And, you know, if, if your water heater is on the fritz, then, you know, maybe it's time for a belt promotion or something. I've seen that happen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Oh, don't get me started. Yeah. I'm sure, I'm sure we could have a whole other episode just, just on martial arts integrity, but. We'll save that for another time. Oh, yeah. So if people want to get a hold of you or, you know, see what you've got going on, how can they find out more? The best thing to do is to go to C-E-C-I-L dot, I mean, C-E-C-I-L-R-Y-U dot O-R-G, Cecil Ryu dot org. Okay. That has the links to all the uh, community center classes I'm teaching and to my YouTube channel and my uh, Facebook page, and it's got my Yahoo email on there. Great. And, of course, we'll have that linked and all the other stuff linked. You've got some some good stuff at, at your YouTube page. I, I would encourage people to go check it out. You're very thoughtful and very insightful in the way that you approach martial arts, which was the reason I wanted to have you on. So I appreciate what you're doing trying to get this community, our greater martial arts community, to think. Mm -hmm. And it's something that I appreciate. And, you know, you've got me thinking about some things, too, which is always fun. I'm a thinker. Well, I'm glad you like that because, you know, we're supposed to we're supposed to talk about morals and philosophy. And, you know, I integrate my faith into it, too. But basically, the students really don't want to hear that. <laughs> they want to come in and they want to move. So the YouTube yeah. channel is a good outlet for that. Good. And I, I hope you continue to put up more material there. I'll certainly be following to see when you do. So let's let's close it up. What do you, If you had to sum it all up into a couple nuggets of information, what would you throw at people? What's your parting advice for those listening? Um, just keep at it. Um, sometimes, you know, you may, you may come into some situations where people are giving you feedback that you really don't want to hear. Like, I used to dream of one day, oh, I want to be the person to come up with their own style and kind of go off on their own. And then when I finally heard that, hey, it's time for you to leave the nest and just go out on your own path, I didn't feel like I was ready. And so that's why I call what I do now Cecil Ryu Martial Arts, like Cecil style of martial arts. I got graded. I asked basically the, my peers to grade me. I was working with for the third and fourth degree. I wrote out the test and everything and they graded me because there really is time. You know, I thought that in order for me to be able to do that and start working on my own system that I had to be perfect, but you don't have to be perfect. You just have to be ready or just on your own path. And one thing I saw that I really like to say to people, two things, first to people that are going for, if they're ever going for their first degree black belt, don't necessarily look at your instructor and think you have to do ex everything as perfectly as your instructor does. Because as long as many years of ex as you try to get your black belt, your instructor's probably been a black belt two, three, four times as long as that. So you're really kind of setting yourself up for failure if you think I have to be at this super high level just to be what a lot of people try to say is the first step. And for all the, the people who consider themselves to be street fighters, Formal martial arts training is harder. I know martial artists go out there and they get beat up. I've heard so many stories about martial artists getting beat up. I know people that have beat up martial artists that had a lot of formal training.
But I'm telling you, formal martial arts training is difficult. Don't sell it short. And it's good for you, too. Just doing the activity is good. You can get a lot of benefits out of martial arts. Just do them. You don't even have to be a champion. Just going through the motion, showing up, and finding a way to apply it to your life, it's, it, it's great. It's, it's good for you. Great advice. Well, Mr. Washington, I really appreciate you being here. And really, and thank you for your time and your, your, your openness, your honesty. Hey, thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to episode 27 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. And thank you to Mr. Washington. If you like the show, please subscribe so you never miss out in the future. And if you could help us by leaving a five-star review wherever you download your podcast, it would make a difference. Those reviews help new listeners find the show, and you might hear us read yours on the air. If we do, go ahead and email us at info at whistlekick.com, and you'll get a free thank you pack, including some great stuff. Shirts, stickers, water bottles. We won't promise what's in it, but it'll be great, and we're even going to pay the shipping on it. Please don't forget to tell your friends about the show. Word of mouth is the way that this show grows, and your help is really appreciated. You can check out the show notes with photos and links to everything we talked about today over at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. While you're there, if you want to be a guest on the show or you know someone that would be a great interview, please fill out the guest form. And don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter. If you want to follow us on social media, we're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram, all with the username Whistlekick. And check out the great stuff we have at whistlekick.com. Gear, shirts, pants, and a whole lot more, all made for martial artists by martial artists. So until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.